everyone and welcome from all around the world and this is what i love about tech today is that you need to think global rather than just local and today i have with me frederick carey now fred's got a very varied and extensive career in business uh he's he was confused about whether to be a lawyer an entrepreneur or just have a lot of fun and i think he's had a lot of fun along the way He's the powerhouse entrepreneur CEO of Idea Pros to help the inside outsiders go into the inside of the opportunities in business and come to the guys qualified entrepreneurs through the complexities and pitfalls of the startup world, which is what everyone wants to be today. They want to start a startup. So as an operational executive and CEO and chairman, he's built high growth businesses in finance, enterprise software, mobile tech, web services, digital TV. And the list goes on and on. And we're going to find out much more about some of those uh, micro and not so micro heroes journeys. He oversees development growth of over 250 startups. And that's why he gets up at 4 a.m. every day. And he has led many mergers and acquisitions to both as executive and as counsel. Uh, Frederick received his JD degree from Thomas Jefferson in California, where he is today, completed postgraduate studies at Harvard Law School, and obtained his international MBA with honors from the University of Liverpool. So obviously he knows how to cross the Atlantic, which is fantastic. So he, his goal is to help build successful businesses that can make a positive difference in their sector. So welcome to the show, Fred. It's an absolute pleasure to have you, and I'm looking forward to hearing the stories, and I think there's going to be way too many to actually cover. But welcome to the show, Fred. It's an absolute pleasure. Well, uh, thank you very much. It's an honor to be here. And, and you know, I kind of felt like my mom was introducing me. So thank you. Thank you for that. I'll, I'll see if I can live up to a fraction of it. <laughs> well, we always get a mum that believes in you. So there you go. Yeah. Um, nothing like a good mum that uh, does believe in you. In fact, just parents that believe in you. So, yeah, Fred, let's go back to the inspiration beginning to become an entrepreneur was that always there like at 13 were you running like you know a, a cookie you know business or something I don't know where did the original inspiration come from and where were you living at the time well the original inspiration I did not realize it until many decades later I was there's a this is not a plug. It's called newspapers.com. And it has news, newspaper stories from back to the early 1800s, probably even earlier than that. And I was looking for me when I was at a rock band in high school, see if I could find a story because I know there was a story written about me. And instead, I found a classified ad of Fred Carey when he was 16. And in that ad, it said basically, I'm available seven days a week, 24 seven. I'll mow your lawn. I'll watch your kids. I'll wash your dishes. I'll help <laughs> you pack up. Literally, I had this big long list of everything I would do to try to make a little bit of extra money. And I realized when I look back at that, shit, that's something that I've been thinking about all the time. And then after that, I was kind of forced into entrepreneurship because I hated working for other people. I didn't fit in that mold. I I didn't take orders well, and my ideas were always stolen by my boss. You know, it would be like, hey, boss, I got this great idea. And they're like, that, go back and scrub the dishes. And then three months later, team, we have this great idea that I just came up with, and it was my idea. That happened three times, and I was 21. That's the last time I worked for anybody else. Wow. Okay. Yeah, I don't like being told what to do, but I'd sort of kick back as well. So, And, and yeah. we used the term before that, one of the reasons you are doing Ideas Pro today is because you want to give the opportunity to the outsiders to get on the inside of the opportunities and the connections that the insiders who have the money and connections have. So it sounds like you were born as an outsider right from the word go. I was, and that's that's how I always felt. I always I always felt like I, I didn't really fit the mold. And when you look at my quote unquote pedigree, you know, law school, MBA. That on the surface, it says, oh, yeah, you're an outsider, buddy. But inside, I became a lawyer by accident uh, when I was 28. And I had three lawyer, two lawyers tell me, hey, if you become a lawyer, we're going to give you a third of our business. And I'm like, yeah. And I didn't, I didn't, I only had a year and a half of college at that point. And I had to go take all these exams to get the rest of my college, go into law school and become a lawyer. I didn't want to. I was really good at it. And then 
when I got my MBA at the University of Liverpool, I'd already started three companies and taken one public before I got that MBA. So uh, everything I did, I did ass backward and, and did not fit the norm of doing it. I just wanted that validation. So I did it. Okay. Well, it's, yeah, there's sort of like, um, it's that sort of getting that ticket, if you like, isn't it? It's like the validation that you uh, can actually sit down and concentrate for more than 30 seconds. <laughs> yeah, people don't do that anymore, by the way, just a <laughs> newsflash. Yeah, social media's got a lot to blame for that. So uh, we yeah. live in a world of distraction um, while we're seeking focused attention. So that's really difficult. Yeah. So let's wind back to, all right, boss stole your idea three times. You said, fuck it, I'm actually going to go and start my own business. What was that? Well, the very first business I started, I was about 24. Four years, 23 years old, I started a company called Concerts America with another friend. And we found a guy in his 40s who had been making a lot of money and he agreed to invest in us. And it was a concert production business that we did for a couple of years. Um, you know, people ask me, like, when did you make your first million dollars? And I respond, two years before I lost it all. And so that's <laughs> that's that's what happened with that. And, you know, cars and girls and homes. And uh, and then from there, I, I started uh, another company and then became an attorney and then started 10 more. Right. So what was so the inspiration for being a lawyer you mentioned was the fact that you just wanted the validation of having a degree, which obviously you'd left you left college and a year and a half through by the sounds of it so you did the law degree did you go and actually become a partner or you just said fuck it again <laughs> well no i um and i didn't i didn't get the law degree for the paper i got the law degree because they said if you go to law school we'll start giving you a third of everything we make immediately even when you're in law school because yep. i was a rainmaker I, I could attract business and they love that and then they by the way, they're both dead, so I can squeal on them now. Uh, and um, and they 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 were paying me illegally, basically one third of everything they were making from the time I was in law school. So I got my degree simply so I could get that money that I wanted. Right. Okay. And how long did that last? As in that focus? Uh, yeah, I I I was a. And by the way, I'm still an active attorney right now. I don't practice law, but um, I don't want to give that up either because I worked really hard to get it. And uh, I, for about a decade, I kind of left entrepreneurship, really got into being an attorney, was really good at it, but hated it because I love creating things. And it's part of the entrepreneurial spirit is you're creating things. And and I was more in the destruction field as an attorney. <laughs> yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? So um, yeah, my partner's a corporate lawyer. In other words, she puts deals together rather than tear humans apart. Um, <laughs> um, I just made that up, by the way. But yeah, it's, it's, it is. <laughs> she's so she's more in construction and creativity with deals rather than the other way around. So it's really, really good. Yeah. So I totally get it. And um, yeah, when someone hears you're a lawyer, they're going, "Oh shit, okay." Uh, so when are you in court? And you go, "Well, you don't have to be in court. It's just." Um, but I, I do love the fact that talking about agreements. It's actually an agreement is really just putting together. Uh, a paper that helps you when it doesn't work out. Basically, it's about organizing a disagreement. Exactly. And, um, you know, even with our partners here with Idea Pros, when, when people join up with us, they become our, our partner. And I tell them, I don't even care what's written on this agreement. I'm going to put it away and I'm going to do whatever it takes to get you from your idea to a nationwide launch of your first product in your new company. And so I, as you said, agreements on the where the hell is that agreement? Because things are not going well, and and you have to see what your rights are and and what your obligations are. But other, other than that, sign it and put it away. Yeah. So, all right. So you became a lawyer. Um, what was what was some of the next significant moments in in your journey in terms of as an entrepreneur? Um, you talked about the fact that. Uh, Two years after you got your first million, you lost it. Um, that's typical of, of a lot of entrepreneurs. So it, overnight success is overrated because it never is an overnight success. It's like 
10 years down the track, suddenly you're an overnight success. But what were right. the, some of the next significant moments, um, entrepreneurial moments that um, you found exciting um, along the way? Well, I was sitting in South Florida, um, which is not a great place to start an entrepreneurial journey, um, but, uh, at least for me. And the internet was really starting to blossom 1997, I decided to move to Southern California, where I still am in San Diego area. If anybody's local, come visit. Um, and I started a company called Boxlot, which was in the auction space. eBay had come out six, nine months earlier. They were really starting to make a lot of traction. And I thought there was room for a couple of players in that space. And I started that company. I raised a bunch of capital. I got a bunch of employees. And... Uh, and we couldn't catch them. We we really couldn't. It was one of those impossible journeys that the lead horse had all the worst stuff and was really had incredible traction. So I was going to close the company down. And instead, and this is important for, for your listeners, uh, instead, I really looked at fundamentally the sector that I was in and was there a different opportunity for me? And the, the technology that was driving that sector was primitive at best because there was no auctioning on, on the internet before. There was no variable pricing. There was no buy or bid. There was no, you know, put in your maximum bid and we'll automatically incrementally increase that bid for you. None of that existed. And so we doubled down in the space and became a technology company. And 18 months later, we were sold for $125 million on something that I wanted to give up. Yeah. So in other words, sometimes a journey is lasting long enough to actually realize the opportunity that's locked within it. Yeah. Once you become expert enough in the space, you can understand all the components of what drives that space and where those weak spots are within that sector. You think a lot of people give up too early as an entrepreneur? Well, if you give up at all, then you've given up too early because the entrepreneurial journey never ends. Uh, I am right now well into my career, many successful companies, successful uh, exits. I'm raising capital for my company, Idea Pros, right now. You know, we're, we're slowing down our burn rate, slowing down, bringing in new partners while we're revamping what we're doing. Um, there, there, are, there are fires all the time as an entrepreneur, even when you get really, really big. I mean, the Airbnb guys were kicking ass and then COVID happened. And and they're they're they went down eighty five percent in their bookings overnight one night boom eighty five percent and yep. they were really killing it after seven years of not doing well at all and, and so even when you think you're there and you're on top of the world Apple they were public they were getting ready to go bankrupt so it never ends so if if you give up you're giving up too early because yeah. you're going to have these fights so. After selling that, you obviously had a, you're able to hang on to that million or two or three. Is that correct? Yeah. Um, uh, however, unfortunately, with the dot com bust, the, you know, it, it shrunk. <laughs> it shrunk by about seventy uh, percent, but still, it was not a bad day. You're right. So you saw the op you saw the opportunity of the digital age and the internet early. What excited you about it? What was like? What was crossing your mind as you looked at it uh, as an entrepreneur, and had come up against you know a big competitor that basically had shit technology, but it got out of the gate first. Um, what were some of the ideas and concepts that excited you when you saw the internet? Well, you know, I, w I was telling you before we started here that that well before the in internet had really, really taken off. I'd, I'd done my MBA paper uh, entitled Born Global. And my argument was that any company of any size could have a global presence by being able to take advantage of the technologies that the internet was going to allow. Uh, and, and it's gone even further than that, because now more than ever, you can get a complete analysis of any competitor that you want, big or small. You don't have to wait for a public company and get their 10 Qs. You can look, you can see the reviews, you know, where are all the one-star reviews in the competitive place that where I'm playing and how can I make those one-star reviews my five-star reviews? It's so easy now to do well. You can ship all over the world. You can 
you can present yourself as a major organization and have two employees and it's it's an opportunity like never has existed before yeah yeah that's for me when i i saw the internet i got excited and i actually registered a company in australia called media now because it was the ability to deliver and i would look to you know basically trying to get distribution rights to uh video cassettes vcr you know videos um but I, what I did realize was that even though the idea was good, the bandwidth was crap. So it wouldn't be able to do, deliver streaming video back in the 90s like we do today. So so sometimes you get great ideas, but they're, it's bad timing. Are, are there any experiences you've had of that? In other words, great idea, bad timing. Oh, yeah. I, I, I had one that were, you would have loved it if you did this media now and this stuff. We had a company called Azure. I couldn't get funding for that damn thing, no matter what. And it was brilliant because cell phones were not, you know, the cell phone wasn't the be all, do all. My life is on my phone uh, place yet. We were still very much into uh, PCs and, and Apple products and laptops. And we created this technology that would allow you to create your, your own web page. It doesn't sound like much, but... You could go and find five, six, seven things you were really interested in. New York Times, the Fox Sports, uh, Fashion Week, whatever it was. And you could go clip out the, the trending news on each one of those sections or whatever that main component was. And you put it on a page, simple page. It was your page when you logged on your computer. And all those things would show up real time on one screen so the best of everything you wanted would be playing for you real time on that screen. It was brilliant, but nobody wanted it. I couldn't get funded. And now if you cut and paste anything on your Microsoft device, probably your Apple device as well, it's our underlying technology that that enabled that in the first place. I couldn't get a penny for it. Yeah. Yeah, it's um, timing can be everything. I think uh, I read a TED talk, watched a TED talk recently and it was like, uh, entrepreneur that had been involved with 200 startups and he said the the biggest factor in success was timing um and that was even bigger than raising buckets of money so where did yeah. you get good when did good timing show up for you that the, let's look at the flip side how, <laughs> how did good timing work for you and when have you got a story to share on that Oh, yeah, I got a great good timing story. Um, we started this company called Imagine Communications, still exists, imaginecommunications.com. And uh, we started the company, it was me and two Israeli engineers. And the HD was really coming into vogue at, at that time. And cable companies around the world were screwed, because their cable infrastructure could only support one megabit of data, which was one standard definition channel coming into the home um, you needed one and a half for hd at that time so they couldn't do hd they couldn't do anything we <coughs> approached the cable industry and basically said we can fix your problem we we can increase your data throughput so that you can do hd and basically they said we're here we'll buy a shit ton of your stuff if you can do that we left and the engineers were like we can't do that <laughs> and uh, I, said, <laughs> I said, we can do that. And, and nine months later, uh, all thanks to them, nothing, uh, no thanks to me, they created a technology that, that quadruples the throughput. So not only could you do an HD channel, you could do two HDs and one SD, all going to the same household using the same pipe that was going into that same home. And so we did 20 million in revenue our very first year, uh, had one product. The company now has hundreds of products. They're on every single continent except Antarctica, and uh, they deliver content to about 52% of the household, television households all over the world. And that was a perfect timing moment that there was gloom and doom for the cable industry, and, and we fixed that problem. What year was that? Oh God, uh, I don't remember two thousand one or something. Okay, so early, early, basically early two thousands. Yeah, uh, yeah. So, yeah, because if you look back at old sort of videos and stuff here, you know, cable, and you just look at it in TVs, you're going, "Gee, the quality of the uh, you know video screen was just shocking." Um, yeah, 
But the other thing, not only the quality you increase, but the ability for them to actually to sell other products. Because if you were doing able to do two or three HD in one standard SD, when, then you basically can sell more product. Yep, exactly. Yeah. So where's that company today? So is that, um, and what's yeah, your they're, problem? They're doing about 800 million a year in revenue now. And uh, they have uh, tens of thousands of employees. And uh, they're uh, delivering about $52 billion worth of ad content for for clients ar around the world. So it's thriving, still private, doing very, very well. So um, why did you exit? Or have you or you just have a share in it? Oh, well, I exited as CEO. It got way too big for me. I, I don't uh, I don't like to wear a suit and I don't like to deal with companies once they, they get that big. You know, I'm good from zero to 100 million. And then after that, uh, then I got to get out of there. In other words, I put suits on and gets a bit boring. Yeah. Yeah, it gets big, boring. The growth isn't as enticing, and um, it, that's just not where I play. I, and, and and frankly, uh, I'd probably be a disaster trying to run a billion dollar company. Yeah, well, I think you've worked out. So you've worked out what you're good at and what you're not good at. Is that right? Right, right. Yeah. Or my ex wife would probably add a lot of things to the not good at. <laughs> yeah, well, par well, guys, but just his ex wife's channel actually joined us. So I had to get rid of her before we started. <laughs> that um, yeah, so, so the next project, and it sounds like you've had a bit of, I'm a bit of a Joseph Campbell fanboy, and um, it's been mentioned. <clears throat> Joseph, you know, Joseph Campbell talks about the hero's journey. So, what what <laughs> so what you've had is you've had actually sequential heroes journeys which i think yeah. most of us as humans actually have so what was the next significant heroes journey um was that ideas pro that we can share before we get to ideas pro and where that came from and and why you're doing it today what else well, uh, i'm not sure if you have like a four-hour show uh but <laughs> i'll uh, other companies, I'll just kind of blast through them. Other companies that I started as one was called Path One, uh, which was uh, that company was actually doing uh, real time HD quality live backhauling from sports arenas. So the first HD live sports that your audience saw on television was through our product. That's another product where we got laughed off the stage while I was presenting it because nobody thought you could do backhauling using the internet. And when I say backhauling, that is basically think of a big trunk, not what's going into your computer or your phone or anything. This is a shit ton of data that is being delivered real time to studios in New York and in LA. And that company went public uh, on the American Stock Exchange. We did We did quite well with that one. Uh, we had another company called Home Bistro that was a cooked food delivery company that went public as well. And we uh, um, then we, I'm speaking the royal we, uh, then after that, I uh, started Idea Pros about four and a half years ago. Right. So where did that idea come from for Idea Pros? Uh, pardon the pun. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I got to the point, they say the first part of your career, you're, you're, you're building up your resume and in the second part, you're building up your legacy. And um, it was a legacy moment for me. I wanted to have one more ride uh, at the rodeo and I wanted to do something that was impactful. My whole journey at this point is try to change the lives of 10,000 people in an impactful enough way to to get them to carry forward. So if I could do 10,000, they can do 1,000 and those next ones can do 100, that's a billion people. So if I get a 10th of the way there, I'm still doing pretty damn good. And um, and so I looked at the heart of where I came from and that is that entrepreneurial journey that we talk about and that you talk about in your show. And the reality is we look at that journey and we all want to be entrepreneurs now. There's a massive exodus from corporate America, and I'm sure it's it's the same all over the world. We have 550,000 new entrepreneurs are born every single month in the U.S. 300,000 babies are born. That gives you an idea of the size of, of, of that market. And yet, well over 90% of them are outsiders. 
and they don't have that inside track. They don't, they didn't go to a prestigious school. They don't have an MBA from those schools. They don't have a professor that can make a phone call and get them $10 million for a paper napkin idea. They're outsiders and they don't know what to do, when to do it, how to do it, who to speak with. And even if they do everything perfectly, they don't have the connections to go get capital, speak like a finance person, open up doors at the different big box companies or get distribution networks. They just don't know how to do that. And so I decided to work harder than I ever have in my life and start Idea Pros. So Idea Pros, tell us a little bit about how it works um, in terms of um, its structure and processes, just um, to give us some context of, because it sounds to me a little bit like you're running a coaching company for entrepreneurs, but I'm sure it's a bit more than that. So tell us a bit about how Idea Pros, how do you onboard them, um, how do you look after them and how do you help them, you know, make yeah. money? Yeah. Yeah, I wish it was a, co a coaching program because I'd be able to sleep at night. Um, but the reality is, the very first thing you want to do, suppose you want to build an app, is you know I'm working in corporate America. I've even reached upper management. My life sucks. I'm going to go out and do something you can't do in Australia. Go out and buy a gun and do myself in, or <laughs> <laughs> or I'm going to completely change my life. And, and we grab the latter half of that equation. And, and those people that want to completely change their lives, they jump into this cesspool of uh, how do I build an app? Or where do I find an app company? And it's a, the worst thing you could do. It's it's just like, I need brain surgery. Where can I get brain surgery equipment? You know, and that's, that's typically what happens with an outsider. You just like, I don't know how to do it, but I'm going to do it. I fucking hate my life. And I'm going to start something new. And, um, and by the way, I said, fuck, because you said I had permission to say it. So, <laughs> so, <Yeah. laughs> okay, thank you. So in any event, um, when those people type in, uh, I want to, you know, where do I get an app company? I have an ad that shows up and, and basically says, you're about to make the biggest mistake you've ever made in your life. You don't need an app. You need to know how to be an entrepreneur. You need to know how to start a business. And then that app is just your roadway that's going to take your very valuable content and deliver it to the people you've discovered really need that. And so that's how we bring people on. And typically, this is the flagship product. I have a bunch of other stuff now, but this is the flagship product. They would come on with a raw idea and they would pay me $100,000 or more up front. And I know the audience is gonna say, wow, that's a lot of money, but hold on, just be patient. And, and about 30% of the equity of the company we're gonna to form together. And in exchange, we literally do everything. Um, we train you how to be an entrepreneur. We have five phases that we go through from the discovery phase, naming, branding, positioning phase, all the way through to nationwide launch at the, at the end of that. And we do all the work. We have all the contacts. We, we build um, from an engineering standpoint, if it's a physical product, from an app development standpoint, if it's an app, uh, you know, naming, branding, positioning, market research, competitive analysis, Who's your target customer? How to go after them? Go to market strategy, building out your web, your web uh, pages, your advertising content, your social media presence, and launching. And so, hundred thousand dollars is a ton of money, but it's five hundred thousand to a million dollars to do that on your own, and you're going to make a ton of mistakes. So that's that's what we do, and that's become overwhelming. So now I do a lot of other things too, because in you know less, and I don't want to take all the rest of your time here. So I'll, I'll be done in just a second. The, we got 100,000 applications in the last two and a half years. And we've taken wow. on 400 entrepreneurs. So 100,000 people saying that they are pay you $100,000 is a $10 billion market. And uh, if 90% of them are bullshitters, it's a $1 billion market. Um, and if it's 99%, it's still a $100 million market. So so it's a it's a nice market and there's a big ass demand and we just can't create enough infrastructure to serve them all. So I put together a more appropriate funnel that starts with free, you know, all sorts of free content, seminars, webinars to a few hundred dollars, get a masterclass, 15 modules uh, on how to be a real purpose driven entrepreneur and all the elements of what it really takes to think very strategically uh, how you're going to go set yourself apart from the competition. That's like a few hundred dollars. And then for about $1,500, you know, prove to me my idea doesn't suck. 
which is basically extensive research and we get, get you a 40 page report and tell you what you, where you wanted to be where you should be what to watch out for how to go to market and a pitch deck of how to go out and raise the capital you need to to go be a kick-ass entrepreneur and we got we have stopping points all the way up to full partnership so now i can serve most of those hundred thousand people that wanted to work with me yeah because that's what crossed my mind when I mean, initially you mentioned ideas pro and the fact that you're taking all these you know people through a journey because that's incredibly time intensive a lot of hand holding a lot of uh you know, smacking them around to get them behave you know all that stuff so so what you've done is you've created a more scalable product right right yeah. because uh, look not everybody has a hundred thousand dollars but everybody is going to end up spending that over time so if I can take somebody right in the very beginning and teach them how to be a really good entrepreneur for a few hundred bucks, then they're going to have a lot more capacity to go out and understand how to go raise capital. If I can take somebody for $1,500 right up front and tell them, hey, your idea sucks, man. Just stick in the corporate world. You're not going to make it, uh, which which very rare I do that. But I have. You've, there's some crazy ideas out there. But um, most often it's basically okay you want to do this you need to do this instead and and really give them a prop in the right direction in the very beginning it's very very valuable so so even though you can't afford that hundred thousand right up front there's a pathway to get there whether it's your own money or whether it's us showing you how to go get money from people that will believe in you yeah so it's and that's true you're actually asking for a small commitment first to do actually yeah. then for you to, I suppose, to show them uh, what needs to be done. And once, once, and as we know, small commitments can lead to a lot bigger commitments, which is what the end goal is, isn't it? Yeah, look, if you're an entrepreneur, you're always gonna be an entrepreneur. Maybe to your point, what you said about failing too soon. And I said, if you if you leave at all, you've, you, you've left too soon. Um, if you go back to corporate America, within about six months, you're gonna hate yourself again. And you're going to want to come back out there, right? So it's not like somebody's going out. I found that there's a toaster oven. I can toast and bake in one thing. That's fucking awesome. And you go out and buy a toaster oven. Well, you're done. That's the end of your journey. You know, you might go out to buy a, a, a full oven next. Who knows? But that's the end of your journey. If you're an entrepreneur, you're taking another bite of the apple all the time because it goes on forever. This journey does not end. And as long as there's valuable information and content that you can provide to people on that journey, it arms them. It enables them to do a lot better than they were otherwise going to do. So if you have a customer or a client or a partner that's an entrepreneur, they're likely to continue to be your, your client at the very least because they need you. Yeah. So you're saying that uh, the entrepreneur is basically soft-wired, as we say, um, rather than hardwired within internally to be an entrepreneur. So what drives you? Is it a multiple range of things? Like, is it curiosity? Um, the, the thing I really get um, curious about is um, at different stages of your life, you get so motivated that you get up early, you do stuff, no, do what it takes. Sometimes you pull back from that and then you, you might get back in it, but different levels of intensity. We also get older, uh, less energy and so on. Um, for four years, for example, I started my media company, the blog and so on. Um, I got up at 4.30 a.m. and wrote every morning before I started my day job, which was a side hustle. So what drives Fred? What gets him up in the morning going, shit, I want to get this stuff done. Uh, I want to start a new project. And because I'm curious about that for all of us, like, um, and Almost it's a self-flagellation as well because you got up at 4 a.m. this morning to try and do another round of funding. What drives Fred? Inadequacy. If I had to pick one word, uh, the fact that I never feel like I've done enough, no matter how many things I work on, no, no matter how many projects I have going on in a day, no matter how much money I've raised yesterday, I always feel like I can do more. So when I wake up in the morning, I, I kind of jump at the day ahead of me because I feel like yesterday I didn't do quite enough. And, and that's really my driver. That coupled with the fact that there's a real beauty in the creation process. And when you have 
one of your partner companies go out and do a launch and write to you and say that you've changed their life forever it's pretty rewarding and I have 400 opportunities to do that right in my own little portfolio so as that motivation sounds like motivations just evolved a little bit in other words you feel like you're making a difference now as opposed to making money and also curiosity obviously you had curiosity otherwise you wouldn't have done what you've done so making a difference is a big component of what drives Fred today yeah I'm making a difference I'm not making money I I uh I I don't pay myself. I uh, I I invest in in our company, and I know that there will be a big payday here uh, near the near the end. But right now, my focus is on enabling others. And all of you out there that have a startup, you know how painful that is on a day to day basis. You can have glorious moments, and a week later, there's something that happens, some fire you have to put out, some pivot you have to make, some pain you didn't expect. I have that times four hundred because not only are we a startup but every single startup that we have that's uh you know a little baby startup uh they have tons of pain and despite the training that we give them they don't have 40 years of experience to rely upon to to find the right solution so it is uh interesting uh conclusion to my professional career choosing this as the last i'm giving the most um i'm getting a ton back in positive reinforcement. I'm also, by the way, to be completely open kimono, I'm gonna get, I get negative stuff too, because there's a subset of people that when you're handling so many people, there's a subset of people that are not successful fast enough, or their product isn't built fast enough, or engineering got to a certain point, and then they have to change it. There's a subset of people that wanna blame you because they came to you to change their lives and now their lives aren't changing as fast as they wanted to. And so you know, you're the bad guy. And, and that happens as, as much as if you can help 10 people and one is complaining, uh, you go to sleep at night thinking about that one who yep. who thinks you did them wrong. Yeah, exactly. So it's, it's always the two opposites. It's a good with the bad. Um, yeah. It's good versus evil. It's it's it's, it's, it's being human. Um, yeah. So what I'm curious about is as well, sort of curious sort of guy uh, you've been in the tech industry you've noticed trends you've sensed trends you've seen you're a pattern recognition animal okay so today we have maybe the one of the biggest trends in tech that has turned up since november 30 2022 which is ai chat gpt <laughs> chat gpt gave a human simple interface to AI, which has become the fastest growing tech human interface platform ever created in the history of the world. It went from zero to 100 million users in about eight weeks, much quicker than Facebook, much quicker than any other tech. I've been curious about, and you are seeing, you're overseeing 400 startups, entrepreneurs, I've been intrigued by your uh, insights about AI, where it is today and where it is going. I'd be are you willing to talk about that. Yeah. AI is what you call a, a black swan event that when it happens, like you said, 100 million users uh, literally overnight. It's one of those events that nobody anticipated. But then after it happens, you go, oh, yeah, of course. It should have been that way all along. Uh, and and you become instant billionaires when something like that happens. It, does, it doesn't happen very often. Uh, Google is not a black swan event. Facebook was not a black swan event. Uh, maybe the invention of electricity was. But it's one of those rare moments in history where the entire world shifts. There's a beautiful component to that. There's also a dangerous component to that. And we'll see which one takes control. The, the, the beauty is that if you're talented, if you are an expert in your field, AI can really help you. It's not the final product in many cases because you have to go and use your expertise to really massage it. But you can get so many things done in a very short period of time. I, a slight pivot here on this. There is a company that I won't name. I, as you said, I'm out raising capital. We're, we're raising uh, $7.5 million right now. 
Um, there is a company, it's a private equity firm that's way too big for me. Their minimum investment's $50 million, and I'm not looking for that. One of their managing directors said, we're really interested in what you're doing. Can we send you an application form? And I said, I, I don't need $50 million, and I'm not making enough revenue for you to even look at me. They're like, what? you're interesting. Can we just have you fill it out? I filled it out. The very next day, I was speaking with the chairman of their investment committee and with their chief global analyst and this managing director. And they said, the application that we send out is fueled by our own AI engine. And that AI engine determines whether we should even talk to somebody who's applying to, to work with us. And if so, how much interest should we give to them? And the fact that I'm the chairman of the investment committee, you can see that you gleaned a, a lot of interest. So here's a company using it as a tool to really see where's the most potential, what markets have the greatest potential to, to really emerge in the next generation and should we be involved with them? On the other hand, I'm really worried about like the junior high school kids and the high school kids who are not going to know how to do their own homework anymore and all the technologies that are going to have to come out to tell whether something was, and, and they're starting already, tell whether something's AI driven or, or written by a human. Um, it's just the world is going to change in a way that none of us that are alive are, are going to be able to imagine. It's that scary and that breathtaking. Yeah. Yeah, I totally agree with you. It's both exciting and frightening, all in the yeah. same sentence. Um, and uh, I think it's going to have a huge impact on the future of of business. I think we're going to see billion dollar companies run by a few people. Um, I'm interested in your take on that because the ability, in other words, to enhance human creativity um, as well as amplify human activity and scaling uh, is, is unprecedented. So I'd be interested yeah. in how you see it changing business um, you know, in the future. Um, AI is a tool that if you're not using, if you're not embracing, regardless of whether it's going to turn out good or bad, you're probably going to fail because your competitors are taking advantage, advantage of these new technologies. Another aside, I was talking to my my girls, 30 and 22, we're sitting around the table a couple of weeks ago talking about AI and that you could be an author overnight. And and uh, to prove it up, I created a 35-page a love poem book uh, and got it published on Amazon. And it was being delivered two days later to my home, physical copy of this book that was created with very little thought. And... Um, and you can tell by if you really carefully read it. But, uh, <laughs> but the, the reality is you have in business, you have to embrace whatever technologies are coming out and whatever technology is going to change. It's like at IBM, um, they were known for their typewriters, you know, and if you embrace typewriters and didn't move on, you were out. And there are companies like Royal Typewriter that stayed with typewriters that, that disappeared. But the reality is, Embrace it, learn everything you can about it, utilize it, recognize it as a tool and, and, and the H bomb of business tools and, um, and uh, incorporate it into what you're doing. Uh, otherwise, you're going to be left behind. Yeah. You either sign up or get dis or get run over by it. It's, that's, yeah. And if you think about, you know, IBM's, the actual acronym IBM means International Business Machines. Yep. Exactly. And the original inspiration, that business machine was a typewriter, but they that the founder and founders of the company had the vision to see that it needed to keep evolving. And I think as an entrepreneur, and what you've mentioned, you've gone through this countless times, is it can be continually curious and evolving as a human and as an entrepreneur. Otherwise, you're going to get destroyed. Yeah, well, thank God it wasn't ITM instead of IBM, you know, international typewriter machines. Uh, but but <laughs> but the, that's the deal. We have to, especially if you start becoming successful, that's when you have to be looking in two directions. Uh, you have to be looking behind you because your competitors are all over your ass and you have to be looking ahead of you because change is coming and you want to be 
the purveyor of that change. You don't want to be riding along. Uh, e even with AI, right now, everybody wants to have .AI. Everybody wants to present themselves as this AI company. And most of those companies are going to fail uh, because they're they're relying on the next best thing. And there's too many of them. And only the strongest are going to survive in that field. That's why, like when I invest, for example, a little investment advice that we're not really giving you folks. Uh, I always invest in the infra the underlying infrastructure, right? Like last year was Web 3.0. And so I'm investing in, in NVIDIA and uh, companies like that, that that lay the foundation to enable the new technology. Same thing with this. If I'm looking at AI, I'm probably not going to invest in one company. I'm going to invest in the infrastructure that enables all these AI companies because the, you're, it's like betting on the racetrack instead of the horse and jockey. And so when you find a racetrack moment with AI, that's where you place your bets or you create a company that enables that foundational element of AI rather than you can, you know, I can make you a Picasso in five seconds. So really what you're saying um is that you are selling you encourage people to sell shovels to the gold miners yes you don't know which one's going to hit but you know they're going to be using the shovel exactly so so just to wrap it up fred um now you've got time and and uh, limited time so what are some of the tips that you'd like to share with entrepreneurs that are listening and watching this uh, that you've learned along the way that are really, really important? What are the things you have learned that you are bringing back to the world? What are some of the, I suppose, the best tips you could share with us? Well, why don't I do it this way? Let's suppose I was going to tell you to be a coach. I wanted you to come on and be a coach in my professional sports team. And you ask me, well, what sport is it? And I tell you, Paul. I'm not sure. Uh, well, how many players do I get? I don't know. Uh, well, what are the rules? Uh, I'm uncertain. What's the playing field like? I don't know. It could be square. It could be round, rectangular. Well, what's the goal in the game? I don't know. You wouldn't do that. None of us, when you hear that, you, you, you feel like that's crazy. But that's how we go into our entrepreneurial journeys. We don't know. We don't know the market size. We don't understand the competitors on the other side. We don't know who that audience is up there rooting for us in the field. We don't know the, the foundational elements of that playing field we're going to be on. And the number one failure of entrepreneurs in the world is that they've created something that there's no demand for. It's like coaching a team that you don't know what sport you're even playing. So for all you entrepreneurs out there that want to start a business, do not ever think that research is boring. Research is the foundational element of anything you're going to build. If you don't know the size of the market, the growth of the market, the market opportunity, the competitors and their strengths and weaknesses, because you can exploit those weaknesses, and who that audience is and what they're missing that you can deliver, if you don't understand all of that, you're never going to make it. You got to understand the rules of the game. That's number one. Number two, separate yourself from everybody else. Be the apple to that IBM. Be the Virgin Airlines to British Air. Find a way to differentiate yourself, differentiate yourself to really be memorable um, and so that people can know that you're not like the rest of them. That's number two. And number three, pivot. You're never, no matter how successful you get, if you don't change, like I said earlier, looking in front of you and looking behind you, if you're not aware of your co competitors because they're ready to eat your lunch, and if you're not aware of your future because that's ready to make you ir irrelevant, then you're not going to lose. So you have those three things and throw on top of that a big sprinkling of perseverance and you're going to make it. Don't be afraid of failure. You got one more success ahead of that failure. That's fantastic. It's really great to hear that wisdom that has been going through a lot of pain as well as joy. Yeah. Um, yeah. And uh, Fred, thank you very much for sharing um, your journey. And uh, it's fascinating. I'd, I would love to sit down over a glass of wine in San Diego one day and uh, uh, just just talk shit and use the word fuck yeah. a lot. Um, and yeah. uh, <laughs> so I look forward to that. San Diego is one of my favorite cities, so uh, I've have spent. Well, the only time. the only the only bad news for you is we only do wine by the bottle, so you're not going to get a glass if you come here. 
mate, you, you're speaking my language. Um, <laughs> <laughs> thanks, Fred. It's been an absolute joy um, to yeah. share an hour or so with you and uh, look forward to catching up in real life because at the end of the day, that's what really matters. Yeah, take care. Appreciate it. Thank you.